but today we have a really, really special event, the final event, the final BAME Online um, of the year um, with my wonderful friend Shay Akiwowo, uh, where we are going to be talking about digital self-defense. I put digital self-defense as like a little bit of a clickbait title because actually I think we're going to be talking about all things care, um, all, all things accountability, all things justice, love and peace. Um, maybe not peace because I think we both choose violence on a daily basis. <laughs> but um, Shay, I would love for you to introduce yourself. Tell us a little bit about who you are. Hi, everybody. My name is Shay. Um, I have... Uh self-diagnosed uh, tonsillitis I've got a GP appointment tomorrow but my throat is um killing me so if um you can't hear me properly just say so in the chat um but yeah I founded a charity called Glitch um back in 2017 after facing some horrific um abuse actually talking about reparations pre-George Floyd so the world definitely was not ready for that um and it it's sparked a lot of um, conversations around how do we keep people safe online, how much is our online spaces, just new forms of technology that is keeping people oppressed and not allowing people to express themselves online. Um, and for the last five years, been exploring a lot around how we tackle this systemically, from advocacy stuff to um, training and workshops and equipping people. And that all allowed me to kind of develop this book and try and help people stay safe online. And again, my title is also a little bit provocative because a lot of people <laughs> say to me, mm, when you say how to stay safe online, are you telling me I need to be doing X, Y, Z? I'm like, no, the eco system needs to be doing um, um, a lot to make sure that we are all safe online. So I explore these themes in the book and I'm really excited to have this conversation with you, Martha, and everyone else that's joined us. Hello. Amazing. So I'm actually going to start just by sharing like how wonderful I think you are, Shay. Um, like genuinely, I think you're amazing. Obviously, I've read your book from start to finish, but for those of you who do not know, uh, Shay and I have been working together for the last kind of two and a half years. And what you have brought to the world since I've known you and what you have brought to my life has been immeasurable, right? And Shay and I met in the summer of 2020, which was arguably the most, I don't even know, I don't have a word for how that time made me feel. It was like, I don't know. <laughs> it was like a rice cooker. It was like a rice cooker that was on fire <laughs> and yeah. from the depths of hell. Yeah. Um, but it was arguably the most digital time for everybody. I was learning how to navigate the digital world at a time when white people were eroding my boundaries um, as they believed they were entitled to my time and my attention. And it felt like fate that I met you at the time that I did, right? Um, and did kind of, I started um, working with Shay, developing her fundraising strategy at Glitch. Um, but actually what I learned from Glitch was that this is an organization that was there to support me, people like me, people in the exact position that I was in visible online uh, with something to say that threatened the status quo. But aside from being an amazing um, you know, colleague and collaborator, you're also a brilliant friend. <laughs> and I've seen you at some of your lowest points and some of your highest points. And no matter what state you're in, the humor, the care, the self-reflection is unmatched. And I know that you would call yourself a dickhead in recovery. You actually use the word dickhead seven times in your book <laughs> and the word ass hat one time, <laughs> which, which had me in stitches, but that's part of it, right? You never pretend to be something that you're not. You're always committed to learning and growing and doing that openly uh, with acknowledgement of all of your flaws. And I've been looking forward to this event for so long because I wanted to tell you how proud of you I am. Um, and I'm doing it in front of all these witnesses, <laughs> meeting you. Like we're getting one. married. <laughs> we are getting married. This is like our, <laughs> our anti-racist union. <laughs> <laughs> but meeting you was one of the highlights of my pandemic. It made a lot of things easier for me and it put a lot of things into perspective for me. And actually like reading your book, it was like going through our relationship again. And like a lot of the things that, you know, we've kind of agonized about over the last few years um, was was in this book. So yeah, I just wanted to let you know you're a very special person to me, uh, not just as a colleague, but as a friend. 
um you are free to say something if you want but I can just go straight into no, the question I, think it's, I, I thank you very much for the honor and I do appreciate it and um look I don't think there would be glitch at this stage if it wasn't for you rallying me and pushing me like I'm Nigerian right so if you give me a pound I'm already saving 80p of that I've only got 20p to spend so Martha helping me with understanding fundraising and how to ask for money and who to talk to there wouldn't be this diversity of income if it wasn't for glitch doesn't mean that we don't need any donations today people have <laughs> money um but like you know props to Martha for being like one of the beacons of of glitch and like definitely part of our legacy and history so thank you very much to yeah. summer 2020 for bringing us together and, and it was Twitter actually it it's always Twitter. It's so funny you said Beacon because part of the reason I started with Glitch was to set up their database called Beacon. So the fact that you associate me with the word Beacon terrifies me. <laughs> and the rest of the team. <laughs> so we're here to talk about your book and many, many other things. I have read this book for co from cover to cover and I have like a million notes. I'm not going to embarrass you by like reading straight from the book right now because I feel like we need to get into it. But let's talk about it. You know, you have written this book that is unlike anything I've ever read. Um, why did it need to be written? What was it like writing a book? This is your debut book. Oh, somebody's just ordered a copy I've seen in the chat. Um, part of the reason this book, this event is free is so that you can spend the event money on this book. Um, but what was it like writing your first book? And what have you learned from that? Oh my God, writing the, writing the book was, therapeutic I could see how much I'd grown in my kind of concepts and my thinking and I had to have this inner dialogue with myself where I could remember like little Shay or she was she was called Oluwa Shay in school being told by her English teacher that she was like crap at English and and wouldn't like can't read properly and having all of these like barriers mentally in my head about why I couldn't write but actually flourishing really well and like doing like I was only commissioned to write 20,000 words, it's 36,000. So that's an overachieving Nigerian again. But like, I, it, was so, it was so therapeutic on so many different levels to write the, write, write the book. The bit that I found hard and the ickiness of it was selling it, like selling the book, selling a product. I'm not a salesperson. I'm, I, I, I never got into the Avion, Avil, Avilon pyramid, pyramid scheme thing at school. Like I, that's not my thing. So I found that really hard to go from writing, publishing, thought leadership to now marketing. And I've been, I've been very open about this as I've been talking about the book. Like my one regret is marketing the book so much during my sabbatical. That was my one moment of like rest and having that three months off. And I didn't quite realize the, the how much that was going to impede on my rest. And maybe I wish I could have pushed back on the release date a little bit, but you live and you learn, right? Yeah, definitely. I feel like so many of us are guilty, particularly me <laughs> of our downtime being like oh let's do that like other thing that's a little bit separate from our work but like oh my god know. I think Gabby's on the call Gabby at Glitch she was the one that was like you know writing a book isn't a hobby it's a <laughs> <laughs> and I was like oh is it like you don't realize it's work like yeah. that is serious work as well because like you're giving yourself to the world. And like, that's, that's what I like, I love about this book, right? Is because it is like quintessentially you. I mentioned that you said dickhead seven times in the book, right? But there's something about how you just brought in like your humor, like just Idris Elba and Adele came up several times. And actually it was, it was like having a conversation with a friend, right? Who's like, hey, like, actually, I think you need to hear about this. I think, I think you might need a little bit of support. And I think we all need to do this together. But I'd love to know from you, why did you write this book? Like, wh what is it all about? Well, I'm really glad that comes across because that's why I wrote the book. Um, Glitch started from, Glitch started in many different ways. Obviously, you can read it in chapter two of the book. Um, I went into schools, talking to, particularly boys' schools, talking to them about how they can stay safe online and be allies online. But I also had a lot of friends who were in public life, in politics like me or standing for um, um, positions in politics or campaigners saying, oh, I'm a little bit scared of being online. Do you mind helping me look through my social media? And so I literally was going to coffees with people. I hate coffees. It gives me a stomachache. Um, 
so I had hot chocolate but I was having hot chocolate with people in cafes constantly and I was like okay I can't do this plus workshops Monday to Friday because kids schools are quite scary I'm not cool anymore how do I get this information out more like accessibly and so I developed the first resources for Glitch um, which was about how people could host conversations about online gender-based violence in their schools or in their community groups or um, after school um, activities or even at workplaces at lunchtime so it, it did start the conversation and, and I and I really wanted that to be the case like we need to spotlight how much we haven't had a conversation around online abuse and how much our language is not catching up with the harms that we're seeing online because we've we've made people feel ashamed about this or we've told people need to be tolerant to this and that's why it's really important to have conversations about it in and and make sure that conversation is framed in an intersectional way. And I say that in the first chapter, like I shouldn't be good to write this book. I'm very grateful that I got the contract from Penguin to write this book because thank you for the money. But I should be good to write this book. There were so many amazing people before me who were talking about this that wasn't being listened to. And no surprise that, were, that they were black women in the US, black gamers as well. Um, and that's why I wrote this book because too many people were being um, abused online and too, mu too much of the conversation in the global north was being framed around white women, white middle class people, celebrities, white politicians, and it was completely missing the underbelly, the, the, the real nasty stuff that we were seeing online. That's why I wrote the book. Yeah, I mean, I've I've never I've only read one other book that's come anywhere close to having this kind of conversation, which is a book called Addicted by Adam Alter, which talks about technology addictions, right? And that changed my life actually because it like totally changed the way that I interact with technology. But I think it was a little bit like scaremongering, and I went like really aggressive. I was like, right, I am yeah. leaving all social media. I am out of here. Um, for those of you who don't know, I don't have any personal social media. Um, I just use social media for work. Um, part of that is because I was harassed on uh, Instagram a few years ago, um, but also because, yeah, I'm a little bit shook and actually a lot of stuff in the book like really made me rethink about how I need to take up more space. You know, like I don't, I don't think I comment on a lot of stuff like I don't, you know, I think there was something about self censorship in the book that you were talking about thinking 10 times before you post wondering whether you have any energy to deal with the trauma. And that really resonated with me because I, I'm always thinking, oh, you know, I really wanna say this thing, but like, I know what's gonna happen. So I'm not gonna say anything at all. And actually like, I don't think I talk that much online at all, apart from like share the events that we're doing. And I'm thinking a little bit more about how, how, to, how to come back to the online space with, with, with joy and with confidence. Um, but even the first page of your book, like my jaw was on the floor, right? Like I was just like, damn, this is such a good opener. Like, I'm not going to say what it says because everybody needs to buy the book to read the first page. But I was like, oh. <laughs> you know, like it's, it's really, really, really brilliant. And I mean, you know, you weave in a lot of personal experience as well as kind of the experiences of so many people across the world. And actually hearing from so many women of color from the global South, I think was so important to contextualize what we're experiencing here. But you said something about online abuse was not an issue until it started affecting people in the global north. Yeah. And for me, like that was so, so, so important. And you will see people, you know, panicking about Elon Musk, you know, taking over Twitter. And actually, we had a conversation recently where you, where you were like, you know, it's just it's just another head of white supremacy. <laughs> if you've got any reflections on that. It really is on the first thing you said about making sure when you were having this conversation about online abuse that it is done in a place of like hope and joyfulness and reimagining and and um empowering um because it is really easy to get that balance wrong and then move people into a state of fear and scarcity and we know like no good thing comes from that and liberation can't 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 grow from that it's not a catalyst for that it's not yummy there we need to have it in frames of love and and joy and hope so um I think there's a reason why certain books that have tried to touch on this space before like how so you've been cancelled and things like that, that why it's not resonating with people because it's not given us hope with we're now feeling a little bit like defeatist against obviously billion dollar tech companies and surveillance and 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 all sorts of stuff and we don't need any more fear in our lives I think we need to give people hope um, on the Elon Musk thing, I don't think I've typed someone's name 
so many times in a short space of time. Like I was really worried at one point he was just going to show up in my in my room because I had been typing him so much internally for the board and for the team. You say his name three times in front of the mirror. You know, I'm <laughs> up here behind you. <laughs> please, please. <laughs> but yeah, I look. I do think the Elon Musk thing is really worrying. We think I think we need to follow the money. Like who banked this? Who bankrolled this? What is what is the reason behind? making some really, really, really like dickhead decisions. Like, why is he doing that? We need to follow the money and be, and be what, try and be as as, as much as possible strategic rather than reactive. Um, I think it's really important that we listen to the global, to, to friends and, and, and colleagues in the global South, where if not for Twitter, we won't hear about things like NSARS and Iran, what's happening in Iran and what's happening in Palestine and South Africa and, you know, name it and name it and name it. Like, there's a reason why I think certain money was used to bankroll Elon Musk getting the platforms. I think that's really important to know. But ultimately, I, I think the media have got a problem with Elon Musk. Again, layered, right? Yes, white man, rich people don't really like that, like over, like over wealth, and he that does come across quite cocky and braggy. Yeah, sure, but I do smell a little bit of xenophobia there. Him being South African, you know, I feel like there's something there that needs to be unpacked too, with where's people's heart and intentions coming from. But ultimately, when we're sensationalizing Elon Musk, we're making it about him. We're not talking about it being a systemic issue. We're not see. We, why don't we have this same like uproar when Mark Zuckerberg was buying Instagram and WhatsApp and like also and you know basically starting a monopoly on in 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 the tech world? Um, the 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 concern I do have about Elon Musk is that him Twitter actually has come leaps and bounds in make in being a safer platform over the last five years. Like there are more products on the platform that allow you as, as users to have agency around what you wanna see, when you wanna see it, how you wanna interact with people and to report it and also buy some of reporting, which we know is really important when you're a minoritized person, you can't do the emotional labor of reporting. So we've, we've been able to use Twitter actually as a bit of a benchmark to other platforms to be like, hey, Instagram, hey, TikTok, why don't you have this? So my concern now is Elon Musk, Regnating on that and that being rolled back, will there now be a race to the bottom from other tech companies to say, well, if Twitter's not doing that, why do we have to do that? If they're not investing in their trust and safety um, uh, specialist unit, which is basically the, a really important um, team in, in, in tech companies that look after your policies, um, your safety and like data and all of that. If t if Twitter start making these, the, well, they have firing these people. Well, Facebook are going to do the same, and we have we've seen eleven thousand jobs at Facebook is up for grabs, right? So that's my concern. But I do worry about how much the media make it about him and personalize him when this is a systemic issue, and then therefore it relies. We re we now rely on governments to put in place regulation and put in place frameworks that make sure that all tech companies um ad ad adhere to a standard that that actually supports our safety and joy online. I think you've touched on something that we talk about a lot at BAME Online, which is individualizing like very systemic problems, you know? And I think I think in, in theory, I understood the online space as a continuation of the offline space, but actually as I was reading your book, like it started to really kind of hit home. And I think because I haven't quite processed the last like two and a half years, like who has had time to process the last two and a half years, you don't really quite realize like that, like for me, like the online space is more prevalent in my life than the offline now. And actually, because it feels like a different realm or like people, you know, there's something you wrote in the book about people thinking it's, it's real life versus like, you know, online life when actually like both are as real as each other, which means that we minimize the experiences that we have like both the joyful experiences and the experiences of pure terror. Um, um, but I want to ask for ask you a little bit about Glitch as well. Um, lots of you may not, not 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 know the work of Glitch. It's you know really really incredible. I've been fortunate enough to watch from the sidelines for quite some time. Um, but you set up this organization from a place of trauma, right? Um, and you talk about trauma loads in your book, and I've reflected a lot on setting up an organization from a place of trauma too. Um, and I think, you know, you were trying to heal and trying to seek justice at the same time. Um, so tell us a little bit more about Glitch. I mean, we know what it does, but like, tell us about your leadership um, and how that's developed in the last five years. What's changed for you? 
Yeah, in the book, particularly chapter eight, where I talk about my mistakes and reflections, I talk about the need to be more trauma informed in my leadership internally and externally, rather than trauma led. And the importance, therefore, of mental health services and and community to support you in that healing journey and accountability. And I'm very, very lucky that I had elders in South Africa and Malaysia take me in and like dust me up, dust me off, sorry, and like shake me up when I would say some things that were a little bit too um, white supremacy yeah. <laughs> um, and, 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 and call me in with love. And um, that, I think, provided a real a real uh, opportunity to heal like there was literally like we were in a retreat in Nepal one time and then we had our sessions around tech feminism what would that look like and then we had night school around healing around um body work and around meditation and around breath work and how you bring that into your into your practice of activism and it was it was amazing and that has been the foundation of my of my of my work and I don't think if I didn't get to go to the global south a couple of times and have that that mentoring, I don't think I would have gotten to that place of being trauma informed. I think I'd have still been trauma led. And I think, I hope that's how it's impacted Glitch. We 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 try to have iterative moments and cycles of learning and unlearning. Um, we try and set ourselves up as, on, in a, on a quarterly basis so that we have moments of reflection at the end of the quarter, both in terms of capacity and prioritization strategy, but also in terms of like, is this still realistic? What's tech companies saying? Like, what's the mood music? So making sure that we are staying relevant for, to the calls. Um, I think it's I think it's in glitch in the way that you've got certain movements that are centered around an individual. And I've tried really hard to make sure that we are in partnership with as many people as possi possible. Some partnerships shouldn't have been in, not values aligned. We make mistakes, we, we learn from them. Um, um, because I don't want it to be about me and I didn't have, I never wanted it to be the, about the Shay show. Um, but it's really interesting coming back from sabbatical, how some of that was still in my trauma of not wanting to be out there and, um, the importance of honoring like you can do the two you can make sure it's not the shady show but still be paid the dues right particularly as a black woman and make sure that I'm not a race for my contribution and my IP and stuff like that so I feel like when you're constantly in the work of healing and the constantly in the work of resting and I can't believe how cheesy this sounds um but it's true so much more so much more comes forth than someone who is trying to strive and trying to fight um and I would say my final reflections around setting up um, Glitch is like making sure that you center values in your organization. Like we have what eight values now from abundance, self-care, empowering and, and, and dynamic, dynamic. Um, and that allows us as a moment to like reflect on these values and what they mean to us. How does it resonate with the work that we're doing? And how does it mean, what does it mean for our, for like the, the community that we work with, whether that be the policymakers, the tech companies, or people that come to our workshops. I think those are key moments that just allow us to come together as a team to just like reset a little bit and like make sure that we're all there for each other. Um, but yeah, being a black woman in the in the charity sector, I don't know if you know about the UK charity sector, but it's not that easy. Um, I've heard. <laughs> <laughs> I've heard. I, I think that's my that's probably been the loneliest bit. Like when you don't get to see people like you in like this, that there's what two percent of charity leaders are like BAME. Um and I think that bit's probably the toughest. And maybe if I glitch up as a social enterprise, there would have been more peerships, I think, and more, more people open to kind of want to work with you rather than kind of seeing you as an, the enemy because of scarcity mindset and government funding and all of that. And so, yeah, that bit's... Can we still hear Shay? Or is it just my internet that's terrible? <laughs> no, we can't. Okay. Um, can you hear me? I can hear you. Can oh, okay, I can hear you. I can hear you now. You just disappeared for like one second. Okay, maybe it's just me. It's just me. I'm panicking. <laughs> um, it's really interesting what you said about that kind of like, we spoke recently at an event that I put on about ego and about kind of straddling that kind of recognition, that visibility, you know, and actually where do you, where do you lean into your ego? Where do you try and remove your ego. And I think that's just going to be something that I wrestle with for my entire career. 
I yeah. don't know if you know this about me and Shay, but we are both fire signs. So we like to be in the spotlight. <laughs> and that comes with a certain amount of cost, right? Um, and actually, like, I've been really thinking a lot about how do, how do I not become a representative of this? How do I not become a face of a particular movement? But how do I still recognize, like, my talent and what I can bring and also like the fact that I am awesome and amazing um, but also do that in community with other people so that it doesn't become I'm more amazing than you but we're amazing together yes um definitely um I think it's that language though that that slight nuance of and we're amazing like those kind of things but it's hard because you don't see good representations of ego like we were just talking about Elon Musk before like we don't when we think about ego we think about entitlement we think about privilege and power particularly in this country we've, we've only got the worst examples to refer to right so actually it is really hard and I'm very very grateful to my coach and my therapist both amazing black Nigerian um, women who constantly tell me to go back to my ancestors. There is examples outside colonialism of people who had power and status and believed in honoring and community and serving. And I think a really good example right now that we can, we can, we can refer to is Woman King, somebody who understood their strength and power, but was about serving the sisterhood. Um, I don't know about the whole giving up sex thing though. I think that'd be a little bit too much for me, too much for me. No, let's not even bother with that. Like that fuels us. <laughs> Um, I, I've been reflecting a lot about on, on the kind of trauma informed stuff. And there's a couple of quotes that I'm going to read from your book. The first is from you. Um, and it says turning trauma into activism is therapeutic, but it is not therapy that I was like, Oh, Shay's spitting bars there because it's so true. You know, like a lot of us, and I think I'm guilty of this. I think so, uh, my team is as well. Like a lot of us who would do activism, it is about, it's coming from a place of lived experience, a place of trauma. And actually we will deal deal with it through activism before we deal with it internally, right? And actually like, what does that mean for how we approach our work and how we do that with care and compassion? We don't, we do it with anger. We do it with revenge in our hearts. And a lot of the time we might think that we are coming at it from a place of justice or healing, but actually it's from a place of deep, deep pain. Um, and yes, there's kind of times where you can honor that, but that's been something I've reflected on. And I also have a black mentor, um, and I had a black therapist for a long time. I've been in and out of therapy for the last four or five years. Um, I actually graduated from therapy. I'm just letting everyone know. My therapist is like, you don't need to see me anymore. You're well. <laughs> I was like, what? <laughs> but, but having those groundings, I think, of, you know, black women who have walked this walk before, um, who have kind of seen these things and who, who are there to have your back um, is so important. And there was another quote that I wanted to read, um, which is from Adiola Adaremi, another amazing Yoruba person, I'm sure, um, which says, stop turning your pain into a career, go heal and face the pain before you try to make it your sole identity. And that I think, yeah, it just, it just felt really, really powerful, but also it was, it was a good feeling for me. Cause I was like, yeah, like I did do that. Like I healed my pain. I might have actually started JMB from a place of like uncertainty and trauma, but I've spent a lot of time trying to make sure, and I think a lot of that is from talking to you about how you lead as well, trying to make sure that that doesn't come into how I lead the organization and how I operate with my team. Um, and it's so funny, like these things that like are so personal um, are the reason that we're successful, <laughs> you know, rather than it being about output or about like how many metrics we can achieve. So much of it is about how we relate with each other um, and how we do this together. Um, and that's been a big learning curve for me. Like I came from the funding world where it was competition, competition, competition. And the only thing I knew was to crush other charities, basically to win um, and having to kind of go back. <laughs> I've just read one of the things in the chat, <laughs> having to kind of go back to like my values. Right. And like, what does it mean to lead with joy? What does it mean to lead with bravery and creativity? And I've got a new value. The team doesn't know this, but I've been I've been. I've been ruminating on a new value. Exclusive, sim, sim, sim. Curiosity. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. That's a oh. really good one for compassion. 
because you know you muffin muffin you know i have a I, m- compassion is not in my lexicon compassion <laughs> you could turn me into an ai machine and like spit all the words yes dickhead will come out um idris adele compassion would come very very like low down on that list it's very hard as a as a nigerian woman who as a, somebody who was brought up in a very very strict christian household who believed you know right and wrong binary thinking compassion is, is <laughs> very hard but um i went on a i went on a one of these therapy courses and um, retreats, sorry, and they talk about how to start the compassion journey. And it is through curiosity, just being like, oh, why do you think that? Oh, why do you feel that? Oh, why do you think that? And that has that has been so helpful in starting that journey. I think that's a beautiful value to have. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry to the team. This is the first time that they've realized that this is one of our new values. But and I've been reflecting on it, on it. So it's yeah, so much about that kind of curiosity. And I think there is, you know, it's it's really missing. I mean, you mentioned that kind of AI, right? And I was in therapy for a while. My most recent therapist, who is like the best therapist of all time, like if anyone's looking for an amazing therapist, like I will give you her number. Um, and she, and I was like, why do I feel like a spreadsheet? And she was like, what do you mean? And I was like, everything is so perfectly constructed. There is a formula for everything. Like, I don't know who I am. I only know the formulas, the algorithms, the numbers, right? And it was so like, I don't know, like saying something like that was so like, I don't know, it was just so, it's so, it's such a relief to be able to say like, actually, like, I I don't want to live like this. Like, I don't want to live like this at all. Like, I don't want to feel calculated. I don't want it, you know, and learning compassion, which was so, it's so funny because we had an event the other day and I hadn't actually finished your book. I, will, I won't lie to you. I hadn't finished a book at this point. Um, and on the final two pages of the book, you talk about compassion. And when we spoke a little bit about, um, you know, what, what we've learned from kind of, you know, uh, leading organizations at our last event, I wrote, I said compassion. And actually like reading that in your book, I was like, oh my gosh, we are having like the same journey. We are learning the same yeah. things. Yeah, um, yeah. And I, yeah, I, I think that really comes down to it. And I know you talk a lot about compassion to yourself. And I think that's where it really begins, right? I hate that whole like, oh, you can't love anyone until you love yourself. I don't think that's true. But I don't think you can have compassion for people unless you have compassion for yourself. Um, A lot of that like non-self-compassion is just performative allyship, (laughs) if if anything. And I think from from self-compassion that allows you to be boundary that allows you to develop self-trust that allows you to have a healthy relationship with your body and your gut a lot of people have asked me like how did I set up glitch like a lot of people think glitch is bigger than we are we're a small team small but mighty team of eight people people think we're a lot bigger than we are because I was very strategic and like very calculated in my decision not just from my like my brain but like my gut brain as well and like trusting in my body's wisdom about stuff bringing in lived experience of 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 what I went through and others and that all comes from self-compassion imagine if I approached what happened to me from a non-self-compassionate space I shouldn't have said that online it's my fault I shouldn't have said reparations I shouldn't have did like there would be no glitch there would be no like like hateful conduct policy at Twitter like all the amazing things that glitch has done and had an an amazing impact on what have happened if I wasn't somewhat self-compassionate at that point and I think it's in people's lack of self-compassion that stops them from being but being able to be like authentic allies like you said it stops people from being can, like unconditional allies which I think is being tested quite a lot at the moment like we've seen online with like Kanye and far 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 right like like you getting even more platforms and all and and causing further divisions we're seeing multi-directional solidarity being tested even more and self-compassion and compassion like comes with that we need self-compassion um in our language when someone's facing abuse a, a lot of us respond to abuse offline and online with like so what did you do to do that like it's so like again nigerian upbringing to somewhat say in your response what did that person do to cause that abuse and so i really do think if we could do a lot of self-compassionate work particularly white women who are big 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 um um oppressors and uh, um holders of like white supremacy i feel a lot of this activism work would be a lot easier yeah definitely i mean white women need to let go of perfection like now like <laughs> yesterday and i know that we don't like urgency but i mean it yesterday <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's really tickles <laughs> all right we have, we're not even halfway through the questions <laughs> Okay, so this is more of a kind of practical question, but you can make it theoretical if you want. Um, how the hell do you navigate the online space as somebody who is 
outspoken black um, who is trying to dismantle the very kind of fundamental structures that we live in. How do you do that kind of straddling both your personal, authentic, incredible, amazing self and also your professional, authentic, incredible, amazing self? Yeah, practically, I'll give you three things. Intentionality, community and and like spaciousness. So I think always coming back to your intentions, like why are you online? Like, why are you going to something? Like, I hate a genderless meetings. The team will tell you, like, I always try and bring things back to the strategy. Like, I just don't get why we're doing what we're doing. Like, I always ask that, why are we doing that? Like, let's be intentional about what we're doing and then making sure that we're maximizing the opportunity for that intention and that intention only, rather than trying to spread ourselves too thin, too thinly. And that is an iterative process because it's really easy, particularly in this space, when you're so passionate about the work to get pulled into directions. So coming back to your intentions is really important. Why are you on Twitter? If it's just for memes, cool. Then does it have to be your name? Just in case you get caught up in something. Why are you in that WhatsApp group? If someone's sharing inappropriate images, why are you on Instagram? Why are you using certain platforms? For Just ask yourself why. And there's a whole checklist in the book about how you can just come back to your intentions and your values to like govern how you're going to be on these platforms. The second thing is community because I really do believe in interdependentness. Like I can't be who I am without my community. Um, and there's two ways I want to answer that. I think I have like my community, like my friends. And I, and it's funny, quite a lot of my work friends are my friends, like you, Gabby, Ellen, Eva, like are, are my friends. Like you guys will be at my wedding, at my, at my birthday and at my team meeting on Monday. Like how sad is that? <laughs> but, but like, I think community is really important because it's trust and we're going, you know, we're going into the trenches. Like you said, dismantling white supremacy. I need to know that the people that are on my left and my right have my back and that's going to be that my closest of friends and my community and so I think that's really important when you're navigating the online space who is your community who are you who are you showing up for or who or are you performing for people are you showing up for likes or retweets and I think that kind of sent that kind of question centers you again it grounds you again it can be really painful because there are moments particularly when you're bored and it's you know the break between Christmas and New Year's and you don't know who's going to die in a fire in the Queen Vic or who's going to get shot in Emmerdale. You know, you're bored and you get caught up in the algorithms of, of Twitter and Instagram. So coming back to your kind of community and making sure that they're holding you accountable and you can trust them is important. I've had people say to me like, recently, like, hmm, you look you look quite tired, Shay. Like, do you need to chill? Like, do you need to take a break? And that's community. That's really important. Um, Kalechi, a lot of you might know Kalechi when she sometimes comes off social media, I'd email her just to double check, like, are you coming off social because socials because you know you need a break or like are you okay? Like, I think that's in, that's community. And then the final thing is spaciousness, because the AI tools on a lot of these platforms are set up to like take up our, our thinking time, are set up to make us more reactive. And as Martha said, urgency, perfectionism and all of that, like AI tools bring that all out of us, like all that ickiness, it, they, it, 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 they, they use it so that we are spending time being uh, reactive to the trending hashtags, um, being reactive to like someone someone saying something outland outlandish or, or, or whatever it is and so having spaciousness is really important so I don't I do believe that we should have regular breaks from from social media platforms like we should have regular breaks from everything we are entitled it's not enough to a minimum of 28 days annual leave from work like we should have time off social media platforms we need breaks from friends we need breaks from school we need breaks from relationships family so I do think we need that spaciousness to like regroup and the way I do this practically I have a sabbath in my diary like every month like every week for a weekend I have a sabbath that is just for me and that is and I talk about it in a book inspired by Judaism and that moment of like disconnecting un unplugging and like coming back to your body I think if you can do those three things or at least one of those things it will help reset you back to why are you online why are you showing up how are you navigate in your space and allow you also to be intentional about your time you can't be a part of everything because all, all your timeline will be hashtag free this hashtag blah blah this hashtag you can't be a part of every everything right so it allows you to just be a bit more strategic and i think people think strategicness in activism means compromise or means not caring no it does you mean you care a lot you just can't care about everything at the same time mm, yeah I think that's so important about you know not caring about everything I mean like I do care about everything but like people don't need to know all the time what I'm thinking you know all of that and I think 
I feel I have felt a lot of pressure and I I'm glad that I pushed back on that pressure to comment on everything. I barely comment on anything because I don't one again I don't want the reaction but also like everybody's commenting on everything. Why do we need my com if you if you want me to say something then we'll have a coffee. You can ask me what I think about something. And for me like I think we need to bring back mystery. That's what we need to bring back bring back mystery, yeah, because I know too much about everybody. <laughs> I know so much about people I've never even met before, you know, like people I probably will never meet. I think I, I think you're right about mystery. I feel like um, we've got a problem with boundaries. Oh my gosh, yeah. In this society. <laughs> um, we've got a problem with boundaries in this country and it's not just about, you know, boundaries when it comes to sex and, and in consensual relationship, um, sexual relationships. I think it's boundaries on the whole. I think we don't have boundaries for ourselves and we don't have boundaries and respect boundaries for others. And I think again, AI capitalizes on that and makes us overshare. Um, there was a really good thread I saw on Twitter yesterday. Um, uh, the tick, Toxification of um, oh, I saw this, yeah, <laughs> right. <laughs> Where TikTok creators now feel like they need to capture real intimate moments of their lives to have that reality type kind of viral moment in the hopes that by going viral, they're going to get this deal and that deal. And we know it's very few people that do get that. We know that doesn't even happen for people who look like me and you, Martha. So there is this. TikTokification um, happening. And I think that causes a lot of people to overshare more than they would. I love seeing babies online. I'm very grateful for the people who allow me to, to like their cute babies, but I have seen a lot more parents sharing the most intimate moments of their children online. Um, and I, I worry what that means about, as you said, mystery, boundaries, consent, digital footprint. And are we going to live to regret this in, in, in the years to come when machines are knowing a lot more about us than, than we do? Yeah, I, I totally feel that. Um, <laughs> yeah, there, there, is, there, is, there is a lot of oversharing. I mean, I, I, f I find it really quite bizarre and I'm glad that I've kind of like that. I, I, I'm not doing that myself. Like I'm not really on TikTok. I'm not on Instagram. I'm particularly like not on sites where you have to post pictures. Cause I think the amount of pressure that puts on people to have the right picture, the right caption to look a certain way, just like feeds into all of the most kind of toxic parts of our lives. However, Martha, let me tell you to sell this book. Yeah. I'm going to, I'm going to be real. I've had my, my, my third peppermint. <laughs> <laughs> so wild it's so, so wild, wild. <laughs> now this book i was having to create tiktoks create videos download save trending audios i said all i want to do is just sell this book and i was like is this what influencers do on a day-to-day -day basis i'm doing this for a two-week campaign in the hopes that a couple of people will buy the book so it will look somewhat decent on amazon and goodreads and in bookstores yeah i was knackered i was so tired i can I, imagine I, I, it's I, so I, it's exhausting because it, you're also like judging yourself expecting other people to judge you like having to like look at every I and do not I'm envy back, you. And I'm coming back in second. Is it got at least 11 likes? Is it, or is it got still what people's, you know, names? Is it, is it, are we now going to double digits? Look what it's making me do. Do I really care? Do I really care? No. And I feel that. And part of, you know, the way that we're, the way that we're operating at JMB, like I've been very slow to kind of decide on what, on how we do our comms. Much to like John's dismay, I'm sure. Um, but, but I've been really slow to think about that. You know, we've had discussions about whether we should turn on our comments on our YouTube. But I don't think that's safe for Khadija, who's doing all of, you know, her kind of talks on imperialism and white supremacy. Like, I don't think that's safe. And actually, like, I'm being really kind of slow to think about how do we talk online? What keeps us safe? Like what matters, like for me, like I don't want to be the kind of organization that does clapbacks all over the place. Like I don't think that's healthy for anybody involved, but it's made me, I've been very hesitant to show, to, uh, to, 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 to decide how we're going to show up online. And I think because that's a reflection of how I feel personally, right? And how I feel very kind of unsafe, but also knowing that like the online space is the reason that I have had the success that I've had. Um, but I made so many, I wouldn't say I've made so many mistakes in 2020 because it's not my fault that white supremacists are white supremacists, but the, the, the way I made myself available in that year, as I was trying to build my business, like had serious detrimental impacts to my mental health and my physical health as well. 
I think. And I think only if I, by reading your book, did I put two and two together, mm. right? And there's some parts of like, I was, there was something where you'd written about how do you feel when you go on XYZ social media site, when you're doing your, um, your toolkit thing, right? Or your risk assessment. Yeah. When I go on Twitter, my heart rate is up here. I just have to open the app. And I know that I'm going to see violence. I'm going to see transphobia. And I just, I know, and I saw something the other day, uh, LGBT Foundation posted something about digital self-harm. They said, are you trans? And do you keep going on LGBT hashtags and seeing more and more transphobic stuff? And I keep thinking about the fact that I will read arguments between white supremacists and anti-racists or like, I don't don't know if either of them are actually those. (laughs) And just to see how racists are operating. Like, I don't already fucking know. Like, you know. And I'm like, oh, that's fact finding. But actually, like, what it's doing is damaging my, my mental health. Yeah. Um, I talk yeah. about this in the book. I say, I talk about the addictedness of looking at the comments. Yeah. <laughs> and like how you're, like, kind of whipping yourself to feel something. Because it's better to feel the anger and the shock, the, 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 the frustrations of what is going on there than to feel the hurt, to feel, uh, oh, actually, ouch. Like yeah. that's why you, you're going back to your curiosity value is so cool because it's going to make you feel the ouch more than I think society would allow us to because we always use these defense mechanisms to not feel it. And there was something else about, um, I talk about this conundrum for black people wanting to be online because I focus on black women because they're the most uh, marginalized online. So I believe if you focus on them, then you know you're going to... Um, address a lot more um, people than just focus on white middle class, um, upper class people. Um, And black women are constantly, or disabled people, LGBT people are constantly having to do do this dance of like, am I gonna be online today so I can connect with my community and to to learn something and, you know, have have a moment of joy online? or am I going to have to retreat because I'm just, I just don't have the emotional capacity to deal with what may come my way. And that's what really upsets me because I do feel like there are a lot more people who are not on the brink of abuse and facing abuse that could be allies online. So I would love to see people volunteering to be moderating your comment sections um, so that people can have curious questions or in a, or in a, or in a different way, it can be in an email, email, uh, email forum or something like that. But the fact that the black people are constantly having to choose between censoring or being online that binary just doesn't sit right with me I wish that we could have more options which is why I was really proud of the progress that was being made at Twitter because we were seeing more options for us to have agency online we were seeing the ability to mute to block to filter to have safety mode put on and and that allowed us to engage the way we wanted to engage on other platforms, you just have to like roll with the punches and that's it. You don't know what's going to come your way. I mean, if you look at TikTok, your TikTok profile, and when you go on TikTok, it doesn't even get set to set to your who you follow timeline. It's it's telling you what's trending in, in on your for you page. So it's even you're not even in your community. So there is there is little things like that that could give us more agency. Mm, definitely. I mean, there's definitely that. That's it's such a horrible choice, right? Do I? literally disappear from the online space or do I like risk violence and obviously like we know that when you step outside of your house you're risking violence but at least you can go back home (laughs) you know at least you can go back home and be safe from that but actually with the online world there's violence in your in your back pocket right Um, and it's such a shame because there are lots of people that can't just come offline there are people who use online community slack channels i'm it's not in the book but i remember interviewing this amazing person um who runs a lgbt latin latinx community on on slack for people who from the diaspora all over europe and i thought this is bloody amazing Uh, but he they sorry they are doing this job full-time moderating as a volunteer because of just how people's behaviors and the lack of boundary could just mean that um someone could feel like they have to retreat when they know that that for that diaspora it's so important to have community god we've really like we we're nowhere near the end of the questions like we are going to have space for audience questions at the end i know there's a couple in the chat but i wanted to read something from your book um and it is about digital self-care and collective digital self-care so in my best voice digital self-care means noticing when you need rest and taking a break from existing online it means saying no to others and saying yes to yourself and your own needs 
It's setting boundaries. It's asking for help. It's saving for therapy. That one's important. It's weighing up the pros and cons of engaging with others and sometimes refusing to take part in public life full stop. It's building a personalized toolkit, affirming boundaries and regularly checking in with yourself, especially after traumatic experiences. It is non-negotiable self-love in the face of so much negativity and harm. You're a great writer, Shay. <laughs> Collective digital self-care is about asking how we can be there for each other. How can we build a movement, a community of understanding and unfaltering support in the face of, of a digital landscape that presents a very real threat to our health and safety? We have a responsibility as digital citizens to stand against this behavior and show without question that we will do no harm to others. Good digital citizenship is about doing your part to respect and champion the human rights of all individuals online. But you feel good because it's well written. Like I can see it in your face. You're like, that's me. That's really me. That's really you. Um, I, I, and then I'm, and then I'm also dragging myself because it says, it says to rest as I'm rubbing my throat. <laughs> <laughs> Gargling your salt water with your tongue. <laughs> but I, I, I found those so powerful. And it was that, it was about the non-negotiable self-love for me. And having those like non-negotiables and, and those boundaries, I think I've learned a lot about that from you. And I know that you've learned a lot about that from me. <laughs> so it's like, we're gonna forever um, showing each other what boundaries can look like. But let's talk about allyship and care. Those of you who have been to JMB events, BAME online events will know that we are not fans of allyship in this space. We are very critical of allyship, but actually you gave a really good uh, definition in your book. So I would love to understand what allyship means for you particularly in the digital age and what that looks like. Yeah, I, you're right that allyship feels like, just, do you guys remember that back in, um, I must have been in university, so 2009 to, to, to 2012, um, the golden years, um, when people were wearing the safety pin after when there was like the surge in hate crime and people were like, if you wear a safety pin on the tube, you know, it's safe to sit next to me. Did you ever see that? I've seen a million iterations of that bullshit. <laughs> I feel like black square summer with all the squares. That's a, that's a, a phrase coined by a Nova Reed. Um, and it always makes me laugh. I feel like that and the term allyship has become that. But I feel like if we can reclaim it back and what it is meant to be, I think it is it is community. And in the digital space, it's it's understanding if you've got a platform, um, how can you amplify marginalized voices? Yes, sometimes you don't need to be a foreign expert on Middle Eastern and North African affairs and what's going on in Southern Southern um, Africa and what's going on in Nigeria and, and with, with NSARS. Of course, you don't need to be um an expert in any of those things but you can amplify those voices you can amplify trusted experts i mean you do need to do your research to make sure you are amplifying um um kind of liberation communities not just people who are doing things for themselves but that's a really big way because the algorithms feed off that they feed off off, off engagement so that's a really important thing helping to report stuff i know reporting sometimes if most times kind of goes um kind of gets lost in the ether you don't get any kind of communication but it does go somewhere at the end of the year for most tech companies in transparency reports and we do look at that at glitch we do look at transparency reports to see how how are how is twitter responding to things quicker how is the ai tools that they've used to respond to hateful conduct was actually responding to the intersectionality of things like we need that as ngos those reports are really really helpful and it's helpful for the individual to not have to um report every single every single thing um showing up so I talk about the in my book how um Rachel Tripp who was a counselor with me a white woman she didn't know this at the time she was a I got treated differently by the police when she came, when she came to the police station with me even though I was a counselor even though they told me to come to the police station it was until Rachel Tripp mum of three um white woman um who but that the police took me seriously in that in that in that uh in that room that's another way that allies can um can help physically in the reporting if that individual wants to do so and i think it's about going back to the amplifying thing i really because i know we're we're doing, talking as people of color at this moment in time we are seeing like the far right successfully divide us um 
we're seeing Muslims versus Jewish, Muslims versus Christians, we're seeing Asians versus Blacks, we're seeing Kanye versus everybody, like we're seeing such division and amplif amplifying people who are about unity and multi-directional solidarity is what's going to be so important right now. So that's another way you can be a digital ally. Um, and what I think, I think also, um, donating right and I think that's tough difficult for people because a lot of people were donating to a certain influencer last year who was calling for reparations um, and thinking that was going to absolve them of their responsibility but I think you don't realize that people being a regular donor even if it's just two pound a month to a charity that allows them to plan yet their work your two pound a month times that by 12 24 months pays for them to have like have have google admin pays for them to have higher security um security settings allows them to like um review their data like those little things do really help for someone to be safe online i love that um i actually following reading your i know i keep bringing it back to the book but you know like that's what we're here for get your copy this is a free up. event i'm just gonna say that again um, <laughs> i realized after reading your book that i am not a good digital citizen right true oh, i'm a good friend <laughs> but I'm not a good digital citizen. So something that I did, I had a, <laughs> I had a day off work and I stumbled upon a block list of transphobic accounts. So I reported every single one of those accounts and they're like transphobic comments. And actually like, it felt really good. Like I was just like, I, you know, I got my kind of incident report things back. And a lot of the time it was like, yeah, we've received lots of reports from this account and actually we're going to suspend them. And I was like, Oh, it's that easy is it? <laughs> and it and it's that important and i think i'm definitely guilty of like scrolling past being that kind of you know passive bystander and seeing all this stuff happen and doing nothing about it but what has really changed for me is reporting is not hard like it's anonymous nobody even needs to know but like if you see something hateful online like that's your cue to do something about it without without even having to you know wade in get involved identify yourself like that was and I know reporting's a thing, but I don't know. It was just really kind of put into perspective to me. Like if I want to dismantle white supremacy, this is part of it, <laughs> you know, like this is actually part of it. By reporting, what are you signifying? So you, to the individual, because you can DM them and say, like, I reported this, I've seen it. That helps them be seen. Because when you're facing abuse, you feel so isolated. Like you feel so isolated and such a victim. You feel lonely. You start feeling paranoid. By you saying you see them, by you confirming that what they went through was wrong, you are helping to save a life because you're not allowing that, that seed of, of, of trauma to live within them. And then that's what feeds and that's what germinates. And that's where you see a lot of people go spiral, which is really, really sad. But what does it also signal when you report things? It signals, oh, to the to the bots usually, because it tends to be one dickhead with 10 accounts. It signals to them like, oh, this person's got an army. This person's protected because they also go for people who are isolated, um, who they can easily isolate. It's a tactic. You see it with um, a thing called ratio um, where, and, and I think you can ratio back, like where someone's tweeted something. So let's say it's Black Lives Matter and um, you'll see white people or white bots replying, replying and trying to um, have more negative replies than the, the, than the positive. So you can do that back. You could be like replying back and saying, yes, I agree or retweeting it to amplify it, to undo the ratio. It's these little things that, that teach bots because they are being strategic and we're not going to have time today. Maybe we can do it again in, in the new year. But like a lot of this stuff that we're seeing around abuse and violence, like it's coming from very organized, orchestrated movements. It's coming from far right movements who are funding trans movements, movements online that are um, funding abortion, um, rescinding on abortion rights. It is funding um, the division between Jewish and, and black people. Like we have to follow the money. And a lot of this is funding insult groups as well, who are grooming boys as young as 13, eight. So we have to also be strategic and, and that requires reporting. That requires, as you said, Martha, staying curious. Mm, definitely. Let's back to the book. There's something in your book that I loved. Yeah. And the thing I like about your book is that it's real, you know, it's not like get off the online space, never argue again. It's like, here, here's how you argue with compassion for yourself. Here's how you argue so that it's actually impactful. Here's how you argue in a way that protects the victim, that centers the victim, 
that is all about helping the other people who might be those passive bystanders to see that this is unacceptable. And like, I actually love that. Like, I thought it was just so, man, you're good. You're good at this. You're so good at this. Like, <laughs> so good at this. Um, we've only got, I've got one more question for you. Um, and then we'll um, hand over to our audience to ask some questions. Please do put them in the chat. I know there are a couple and I will read them as um, Shay responds, but get them in. Um, one of my values is joy. I'm sure everybody knows that because I am the most joyful person that's ever graced this planet. Uh, you're a close second, Shay, but you cannot match this. <laughs> well, I, you know when it's like someone's like slapped you and then hugged you and slapped you again in like <laughs> one breath? <laughs> how do you put joy at the center of your work? And particularly, how do you nurture this in an online space that profits from our pain? You know what? I have been really intentional now about what I engage with on Instagram. So I think my Twitter, my, 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 I think I can't, I can't change the way I'm fed things on, 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 on the timeline. It's always changing. Now you're even seeing people you don't even follow come up on your timeline. Like, I don't know how that happened. So I don't go to Twitter for respite, but I do go to Instagram for that. And I've been able to be really intentional about what I engage with and also change my mind. Me and Ellen were talking about this, like when she first joined as my EA, um, when I was when I was about to uh, publish the book. And we were talking about how we, we followed a lot of like fitness people and like people who were going to the gym and stuff. And then at a point, it just started making us feel really shit about ourselves because we wasn't able to go and that wasn't what we wanted to be doing anymore. And we weren't even watching it from a place of inspiration anymore. We were watching it from a place of, as we were saying before, like beating ourselves. And so we said, actually, let's start actively like changing who we follow and who we engage with. And, and since doing that, now I see more sausage dogs on my explore page. I see loads of clips from my dogs. I feel like I'm never going to be able to see her in Vegas because I can never get tickets. Um, so Adele, if you happen to come across this, please, I want to come and see you. Um, I'll send it to her personally. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I got a lot of clout online. I don't know. You mean. <laughs> So my so that is my that is my my space of my my place of joy. I've got really really fun WhatsApp groups like Martha. We're in like free WhatsApp groups across two phones. Like I am in I'm in really good community with people that I want to be in. But this has come from a long a long journey of knowing of being comfortable in saying no to people. It's come with being selective of who has my personal number and who has my professional number. Not everybody has my personal number. Um, it comes with making a lot of mistakes, and I think. And I think also joy is not fixed. It, joy, joy comes in the moment. Joy can be seasonal. And so again, going back to the, my top three tips, I feel like Martin Lewis then, go back to my top three deals. Um, <laughs> being intentional and having spaciousness and community mm. allows you to go back and be like, is this still joyous for me at this moment in time? Because we've been through a lot this 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 two years with 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 um lockdown. What was joyous for you and needed to needed inspiration to go running with your one hour of free time in 2020, 2021 isn't what we need now. Um, and it's, so it's okay to change your mind. And I think that comes back to the boundaries problem. We have a problem with boundaries and consent that we also feel like we can never withdraw our consent. And we always can. And I'm sure Gabby's giving me side eye because she kept saying, you know, you can cancel this because of your throat. And I was like, no, I really want to do this. <laughs> Sorry, Gabby. <laughs> uh, I, I think that's so important, being able to change your mind. Yes. I, I remember I remember one thing I didn't say to your question about community. Can I come back to it? Of course. I said it, I said there was two things in community about your peers and your friends. And I made a joke about all my friends being at my at my team status meeting at my wedding and then, and then at a party on Saturday. Um the second layer to that, as a black woman in leadership, I think community is infrastructure. And I think that doesn't get discussed enough. So if there are people of color that are in leadership positions, taking this moment is a full moon. Um, it's also a really good time to like um, reset, release, um, and we're coming to the end of the year as well. Really think about what does it mean to have infrastructure? Because white men are, it's just, it's just a given that they're going to get infrastructure. They become the CEO, they're given an EA, they're given this, they're given that, like they're given time. They're just given things that, they're given things that I can't even list because I don't know, I'm still learning. So we will never know what they get given because we're never going to get it. <laughs> I, I really want a white white man to mentor. We don't want it. We don't want their shit, man. I want to know what they can ask for because I'm like, really? You can ask for that? Um, 
but 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 in all honesty I think if you're in leadership position as a marginalized person there is a bit of like self trapping in 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 what we and and boxing that we put on ourselves and and I think to to kind of get out of that box you need to build your infrastructure build your a team of people you trust but build up your money we're in a capitalist system yes you want to abolish capitalism but it still means we need money so how do you make sure you're paying yourself well so you have enough for obviously paying the bills cost of living but um therapy and self-care and anything else that you may need emergency for like that's the infrastructure conversations that i think we need to be having when we talk about community so that we're sustainable so that we're still here because a lot of activists burn out very quickly um and if we want to do true community what does it mean to show up for somebody and that may mean helping them with their emails that may mean deputizing for them at, at a meeting that may mean um you know helping them get their hair done or like tidying their flat or helping them get an office desk like that's what infrastructure means because if we want to bring liber we want to bring about liberation we want to bring about these movements we're keeping up with people who've got this infrastructure from the get-go and that's why we're always tired and burning out because we're having to do two things at once i'm literally writing something as you as you're saying this and it is about how do we build infrastructures of joy um and like you know you're there is so much like scaffolding that needs to happen before we can even like Good approach work. joy might that's from my mom who's your biggest fan <laughs> my mom loves shay so much it is unbelievable i'm like I all love right that cool. word, the scaffold it's true i love that word the scaffolding and and again that's why like i would never have thought about that and so i think it's a blessing to have your mom who has been in the system and understood how it works and what to ask for to kind of pass that on which is why i believe in intergenerational solidarity which we don't have um as well as we could in this country, like we see it in parts of Africa and in the in, in the states, we don't, we need to scaffold ourselves properly. It's it's I I call myself an accidental CEO. I call myself a recovering dickhead and um, recovering dickhead and recovering politician. I really hope in twenty twenty three I call myself intentional something because I really <laughs> feel, not I really, intentional dickhead. I hope. <laughs> I hope it's intentional something because I've finally built the scaffolding and I haven't gotten somewhere and put my mouth there and I haven't really composed or fully formed myself yet and I don't want to be this half-baked thing anymore I want to have the scaffolding to support me and it is it this is the nuance right you don't want to not have the scaffolding to stop you from going up to this to, to those places right that's important you don't want to not have the class or the privilege to stop you from going there. But to stay there, you do need the scaffolding until the system's dismantled. That's why we always keep burning out. Mm, definitely. Like, for me, it always starts with women. Like, I am obsessed with, like, the team. <laughs> I'm like, are we okay? Are we doing all of this to get together? Are we learning the right things? Are we coming together? Are we coming? Are we making these strategies together? Are we, you know, discussing these quite, like, difficult, tense moments together? I think often we can look so outside about what's the outcome, what are our metrics, all of that, like how are we presenting to the world and actually like being very slow and intentional about who are we together? And like, I don't give a fuck about the outcome. Like, I don't really care. Like, are we working together in community? Do we enjoy being around each other? Like for me, like that's the most important, um, <laughs> which, which I think is like completely subverting everything I've ever been taught. You're so right. Glitch only now will start having KPIs because we need it for bigger funding and succession planning and, and all sorts of, but we were just happily tracking our progress and our impact and our achievements and our challenges every month alongside some strategic goals. We never set targets for what? How do we know? <laughs> Things are changing all the time. How, hey, what are the targets for, white, for ending white supremacy <laughs> apart from ending white supremacy? <laughs> Unless we have ended white supremacy, we have hit no KPIs. Like, you know? <laughs> right, so it's only now that we've set, we're thinking about setting some very, very broad KPIs for like reporting to, to our new board and things like that. But you, you don't need it for movement building. I think you, I think the care bit is the most important bit. Yeah, and that's what I'm learning. And it's, I, I read something the other day and it was about kind of building relationships of accountability and building kind of like, you know, those like really important relationships. And people think that once you build those relationships, then you start organizing. And it's like, no, that is the organizing. Yes. That is the organizing. Anyway, loads of questions have come in and I'm just like chatting away. Um, let's start with a question from Suleiman, which says 80% of disability is acquired in somebody's uh, lifetime. 
Disability hate crime has increased by 240% in the last 10 years, with over 50% of all police brutality being against black disabled people in the US. There is no justice without disability justice. We agree with that. So how can we have an intersectional and radical approach to our digital defense work that is accessible and supports disability, especially black disabled people for our radical and collective liberation? Great question. They need to be at the center of our work. I mean, I, my, like I said, going to, going to Nepal, going to South, going to South, um, South Africa and spending those, those, those that, that time there, like really got me to understand the importance of queer critical analysis, got me to understand the importance of challenging our ableism, like inclusivity, meaning centering disabled people, because if you make it inclusive for them, everyone gets an opportunity to be involved and they bring so much to the space. And so I think it would be radical and amazing to have a black feminist disabled a disabledist approach to the online space, to a reimagining. And, and I do believe the online space is a place of good, is the extension of our online space. I don't think, I no longer think, if I ever said this before, someone says, oh, but you said this in 2009. <laughs> um, I don't think Twitter is the extension of our online spaces, but I do think online is the extension of our offline spaces. Twitter has been privatized and we can somewhat hire a hall on Twitter so at some moments to do some kind of community good, but it's not a community. So I think when we can go back to that as a framework, that would be powerful to think about what could the, what could platforms be looking like? What could regulation be looking like? What could the standard be? And allowing us to reimagine, I think it would be powerful. Mm. You speak about imagination a fair amount at the end of your book, actually. And I feel like a lot of it always, we always end talking about imagination. Sorry, I interrupted you. Did you have more? No, and I was going to say um, the biggest um, critique of going of Twitter using audio um, because they wanted to compete with Clubhouse was that they weren't going to be able to uh, not only going to be able to moderate audio content quick enough because it is really hard, but that it was going to exclude a, a huge percentage of the population who um, are hard of hearing or deaf, and that was completely ignored. And I think. That's a massive shame, and that that says a lot about what does diversity look like in these in in uh, on these platforms, and how do we humanize people? How do we make sure that we're seeing full human beings and everybody? I think we should center that in our in our in our reimagining of a new a uh, new Twitter or a new Facebook. Mm, I agree, and I think over the last year, I mean, we have brought in disability justice consultants to help us to really understand like what it means to what it why we can't separate that from anti-racism from anti-oppression work i mean we learned so much about the sordid history of eugenics kind of you know yeah. um ableism etc cetera, etc cetera. um and we've been on like a massive learning journey and actually what's been really interesting is that tech has been the way that we have been able to dismantle some of these systems um that you know do exclude people who are disabled and yeah. we've been thinking about, you know, building in tech to make our website more accessible. Like we've got a kind of accessibility widget that's attached to our website. Um, but I saw something the other day that really made me think, and it said, abled bodied is a temporary condition, right? Because disability can happen to everybody, <laughs> you know? And actually um, that's, I, I think that's, a, that's such a much, a much better way to think about this, um, about, yeah, and, and it's really yeah. It's, it's kind of just like rocks my mind, my mind a little bit. Like I'm, I think yeah. if it being burnt out and having chronic fatigue this year, like real, real fatigue. That I don't think I'd be the compassionate leader that I am now to hold even more inclusive spaces, but for all members of the team and those that are disabled or and may be in the future. So you're one hundred percent right that at any moment in time we could be on the we could be on the outside of what is fashionable at the moment in time and uh, and i think i think if you don't have self compassion for yourself then you're just going to keep having these exclusive in exclusive environments and i think being more conscious of your ableism slows you down so i remember wanting to do before i got sick i wanted to do a tweet every single day for six days of activism to show how people could do actual actions around how to stay how people can stay safe online and um, I quickly posted something just before I wanted to like, um, I just, it, doesn't, it doesn't matter. I quickly posted something and I forgot to put alt text. And so I was like, 
So I put a video of it and I then I I put a, a gif of it, I made a gif of it, and then I tweeted a, here's a more shareable format. And someone went, someone went, it would be more shareable if it had alt text. I actually saw that. <laughs> can and I, I was say, like, ta, ta, ta. <laughs> can I say anything to that? Can I be like, well, do you know? No. I uh, fair, do it. Copied and pasted it in, uh, to, from the, uh, the 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 words into a caption, and I and I tweeted it, and that would have slowed me down, take a breather, and be like, do I actually need to do this right now, or what was I doing it for? Going back again to my intention, why was I rushing for what? Yeah, it's back to that urgency. Yeah, of course. Like we want things done yesterday, but like that is the antithesis to anti-oppressive practice. Like anti-oppressive practice requires so much thought. It requires so much coming together, so much kind of weighing up of different options and actually, you know, bringing so much more. And, you know, I saw Etty um, has, has written in the chat about um, having the alt text reminders. I've turned on all of my kind of um, accessibility features. So I'm always getting pinged. Are you sure you're ready to send that? Cause it doesn't have alt text. Um, and actually there is something about, yeah, slowing down. Um, and when you slow down, you see more. Um, and for me, like that's been so, so, so important. And often, you know, as someone who cares about justice, I'm in a rush to be like, we are, you know, excluding disabled people. We need that fixed yesterday. <laughs> and actually like, I need to learn so much about how to like shift my mindset. Um, and also to like, understand that, like, I think what people deceive, perceive as a disability, like it's so much broader than that, right? It's so much broader. There's been times in my life when I've been disabled, but I've never really considered myself as that before. Um, yeah. And so much of this comes down to like, deep, thoughtful learning, constantly committing. And like, the more I learn, the more I'm like, I have to slow down. And the more I learn, the more I'm like, learning is actually the most important part here. Um, and, I, and that takes time, you know, that takes a lot of time. I mean, I have a good friend as well who taught me a lot about pain management, who taught me a lot about listening to my body's signal, who told me a lot about um, minimal viral product. That's all because she's a disabled woman having to learn to navigate life with her body. There is so much wisdom we can learn from our disabled friends, 100 mm. 100%. And I mean, Suleiman has been dropping fire in the chat the whole time, sharing resources with us, enriching our knowledge this entire time. Um, and there are so many people, the most marginalized are the most generous, <laughs> the most generous always. Um, but it's because, you know, we, we all have skin in the game, like we all, we all want to improve and we all want, we want to hold each other to account. And for me, like, I think that's amazing. There's been times when like, I've been called out and like, it hurts, isn't it? I'm like, how dare you say that I'm doing this thing? Don't you know I'm an anti-racist? <laughs> and it's like, no, of course, like, this is a gift to be, you know, called in and to be told how, how I can improve. Anyway, next question before we get on that one for the rest of our lives. Uh, <laughs> thank you, Suleiman, for that. Um, so the next question, I think, is from Zoe at Spark & Co, who manages their socials um, and says, although um, we don't engage in every single conversation, I still find it really difficult to switch off. I feel like I can't switch off. How do you take a break without feeling like if you do, it might all fall apart? You can't do it on your own. So. Um last year last may um glitch uh was was partnered with bt sport so um if anyone watches football you might have seen my afro um on the tv ads talking about how you can spot spot support and report abuse um and working with a lot of um uh, celebrities rio now rio shoot <laughs> rio ferdinand <laughs> kill me for you doing that <laughs> <laughs> rionaldo <laughs> for now <Rio. laughs> <laughs> two geezers names um yes him and uh other talent and i and i said working with bt sport we would love to do this work with you we'd love to do like it's all great right like good profiling for glitch good to get the message out there to that to football heads as well like this is amazing but we said to do this work genuinely we need to deliver training to your social media team. You need to practice what you preach. You can't just now be like BT Sport wants to tell social media platforms they need to be safe online. You need to walk the talk. And part of that was saying that their social media team that were now going to help report the abuse that their talent faced because they were leaving it. They were just leaving the comments there. They weren't reporting it to nobody, even if they had access to platforms. Um, we also, we, they also, they were like, yeah, we're going to have one social media person managing the, um, the, uh, the, 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 the abuse. It's like, you can't do that. 
one person managing the abuse of like all your talent you that's a that's a hr problem <laughs> that we, we we you so you can't do it on your own you need to be doing it in shifts you need to be taking breaks we have the same conversation internally at glitch we have a a general inbox and sometimes people do not respect our boundaries that we're not a frontline service overshare and it is really emotional and we do check in with them the person that manages manages that to make sure that, that, that they are okay and that can come to us to like decompress and feel the kind of constraints of not being able to do anything and in in that situation but we are doing things but you you can't do it by yourself you just can't mm. and also expecting yourself to do it by yourself is white supremacy um it's that kind of individualizing being like i am the person there's a you know someone shared um the features of white supremacy by tema Oken, um and they talk about um i'm the only one as like i'm the only person that can fix this problem and you see it happen all the time in leadership teams like i have to deal with this like nobody else can do this you know i've got to kind of control absolutely everything and it's about community and solidarity you know me and shay no we're not dismantling white supremacy not even together me and her <laughs> you know? as much as i feel like people think you could come close but <laughs> but actually we it, it shouldn't be up to us like it, it should never be up to us and um, by thinking of yourself as like some, an island, like nobody is an island, you know, you don't stand alone, you stand with other people. And trust me, nothing will change if you do not answer that email. Nothing will change if you do not respond to that tweet. Nothing will change whatsoever. The only thing that might change is that you won't feel terrible. <laughs> and for me, like that's so important. And I've had to like reframe so much, particularly when it comes to answering emails. I felt like I would die if I didn't answer all my emails. Like something terrible would happen that I would be seen as a fraud, that everybody yeah. would come for me. And then I just didn't answer my emails for three months and nothing happened at all. <laughs> like, and I was like, oh, okay, this is totally fine. But there is something about that <laughs> expectation for you as an individual to do it all. And as a black, I'm looking, I'm like, I don't know who you are, but as a black person myself, <laughs> that's what the expectation is on you, you know, to persevere to you know to take everything on your back until you until it crushes you until you are crushed by the weight of white supremacy and you can no longer fight um but together linking arms kumbaya whatever i don't care like we have enough we have enough imagination we have enough power to dismantle these oppressive systems but we could never do it alone and we should never ever try to do it alone because it's no fun <laughs> you know what makes it fun doing it with your friends Definitely. It brings creativity as well. It allows you to problem solve. And it's look, I don't want to sit here and like act like I've got it all right. Like I'm constantly unlearning how much I am I have internalized the strong black womanhood and doing it on my own and like having to release, having to like self-trust and trust others. Like it's a journey. So if you're hearing all have I been a white supremacist because I've been doing it by myself? Like, it's not, don't don't go into that feeling or that spiral, go into like, oh, here's another bit I need to unlearn. Like I need to like eject it out of me again because it's so internalized for all of us all the time. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you cannot escape the conditioning that white supremacy does to you. And like, for me, what's been so important is understanding what white supremacy is, what it looks like and how it shows up in how we think, how we love, how we relate to other people. Um, like for me, like that's been actually, I don't think how we love, cause you can't love with, with white supremacy, but, <laughs> but like in terms of like how, how it shows up in your, in your thinking and in your patterns of behavior, like I found that so, so vital. And again, like it hasn't been like, I feel guilty because I've fallen into this trap. Like, how could you not like no one is that special that they can escape the conditioning of white supremacy you should expect yourself to to have kind of replicated those kinds of systems but once you know kind of it is up to you to do that work to unlearn you know and you don't have to do it alone like we have like white supremacy discussion spaces at work like where we come together we just talk through the features we'll be like urgency how is that showing up how is it showing up internally how is it showing up externally denial and defensivism how is that showing up and actually like for me, it's a relief. Like finally, I can talk about all this shit. I can talk about the spreadsheets. I can talk about these things that are stopping me from connecting with the mm -hmm. people that I want to be in community with. We have one more question. Oh, this, this is one. from Rajan. Uh, <laughs> I know um, we're about to end, um, which yeah, I, I'm gonna miss talking to you, even though I could talk to you like immediately after on WhatsApp if I want. Uh, <laughs> which is, I think this is a great question and I think we all um, could learn a lot from this. Um, I don't have an answer. How do you stop yourself from doom scrolling on social media and burning yourself out? 
Um, or at least how do you get out of that habit? Or is this something that you discuss in your book? We can't say, but if you buy the book, then you'll find <laughs> out. <laughs> I should just hire you to do the marketing for the book. So be, I am a salesperson by profession. Like, yeah. You should <laughs> <do that. laughs> um, and if it's okay, can we try to answer Mina's question uh, uh, above if possible? Because that's. Oh, really yeah, of course. Sorry. I missed that uh, one out. We are also going to answer Mina's question. <laughs> <laughs> so um, look, sometimes you need to scroll, right? Like sometimes you just need to feel your feelings. You're not going to perfect your self-care and it's not going to be a when you do when you face this appointment you're going to like immediately get up get up uh, get up um and bounce back from it you're going to do your affirmations in the mirror as you're brushing your teeth and you're gonna you're gonna like as you're moisturizing your skin and for those that do you're going to be telling yourself how beautiful you are like that doesn't happen in real life sometimes you need to feel your feelings and I think there is the occasional time when you're like oh okay it's been 48 hours and I have just I've just seen the same meme over and over and over again um so I think sometimes allow yourself that that um but if you notice, as Martha said, your body changing, if you notice that now ugh, I can't sleep, mm, my appetite is off, mm, <laughs> I don't want to go to the gym. Like if you're noticing mm, my routine is a little bit off, like that could be a sign to just be like, okay, I need to take a break from that. I need to like reset. And that's that's my indicator, is listening to my body signals. And I've gotten better to listen to my body signals apart from today, um, <laughs> of just listening to what my body needs and resting. But look, look, even honestly with that, right? Knowing that this was really important to me to do today, like for me, it was really important to do for me before I left uh, before I left a year, but before the year came <laughs> to an end, um, I reprioritized. I reprioritize, I listen to my body's needs and I was like, okay, body, you need to rest in order to show up for this and you're going to need to rest afterwards. So you can prioritize yourself and your boundaries um, with a bit of creativity and talking to people. So I spoke to Martha and Martha knew I was sick beforehand. So she did a lot of the like reading and carried, like held a lot of the space. So she was going to bring out the energy. So I feel like if you are stuck in a rut, you don't need to like get it, get out of it yourself. And you can listen to your body signals. And if in doubt, say to somebody like, am I presenting a little bit weird? Because then 10 time, ten, nine times out of 10, they people do see it before you even see it. Um, and then- we, oh, go on. No, no, carry on. Go and then, <laughs> burn, burn out. I mean, I feel like we're always going to have a relationship with burnout. Speak for yourself. In, <laughs> That's in, not me. <laughs> activism, because of our system, right? Like, I feel like we're always going to be on some spectrum. I think burnout, where you've got like massive exhaustion, depletion, depression, like what, you know, what I went through this year, I wish that on nobody. Um, but we all face spectrums of that. We all face that. Like I know somebody who said that they have to be on antidepressants to do their job and activism because of the work they do, because of what they see. Like I do feel like we're going to have some relationship with, with, with our mental health being impacted by our work. And, um, and I think that's for us to work it out because I, I don't want people to think that like, oh, once you've had burnout once and you've recovered, that's it. You're burnout, you're burnout like res resilient. Like it, it's not, it's not the, um, the COVID jab. Like I think you just get more attuned to your, to your body's needs. But I think when you're in this space, when you're seeing what you're seeing, when you're, when you're feeling what you're feeling, like the world is really, really shit right now. Like I don't think the economy and the cost of living has been this bad, even when we, it was like the 2008 recession, right? Like that is gonna impact us in some way. And so of course we're gonna feel a little bit ex more exhausted, a little bit more tired. And I think it goes back to our earlier conversation of compassion. Mm, definitely. Um, for me, like I love pleasure. Like I, ha I love feeling good. Like my mom came to visit me in Manchester the other day and I was like, had that, I've got like a, a, a massager thing that I put on my shoulders and stuff. And I got my fluffy, my fluffy uh, slippers that I put in the microwave and that, yeah. <laughs> and I've recently taken up aerial hoop. Like I, like I read this book, Pleasure Activism. And like before that, like I've, I've, I always like, I think I always put myself first. Maybe it's a Sagittarius in me. Yeah. Like I just, oh, I always want to put myself first and, and I want to live a good life. And I've always really wanted to live a good life. So I think because like for me, my focus is is on how, how do I live the good life? Um, I managed to, I, I don't think I've even really kind of skirted close to burnout before. Like I've definitely felt overwhelmed, but actually like for me, activism is so important, but like, it's not, it's not my life, <laughs> you know? Like I have a life, like I've got friends, I've got community, like I do things 
like yeah I have hobbies and stuff <laughs> and, and I think I think often that you especially when you really care about your work like you can turn your work into your life and like that yeah I think that's where that's where the boundaries start getting a little bit eroded but for me like thinking about pleasure being at the core of my activism and when we think about what kind of clients we work with we're like are they going to make us happy and are we going to enjoy this and if they aren't how do we get out of it <laughs> how do we like get out of that contract like quickly so that like we don't have to experience like the detrimental impacts um but yeah i would recommend everybody read uh, pleasure activism the best line from that is no is a complete sentence um that is always stuck with me no is a complete sentence um and yeah i i think you how are we going to fight this fight if we're all absolutely exhausted Mm. Like, there is absolutely no way and I think you know I'm glad that more and more people are starting to not embrace that soft life TM but like really think about what scaffolding you need in order to be able to do this and also like do it in a way that doesn't kill you like I want to be happy <laughs> you know and people... that intention is really really important mm. and people think that doing this work is inherently painful I'm like this is joy this is love this is liberation if we let it be right <laughs> because of the people that we do it with um more often than not and i think you know if you're going out there fighting with racists on twitter then of course you're going to feel shit all the time if you're building community with other people and you're creating imagining new ways of being together new ways of organizing yourselves new ways of setting up organizations new ways of managing your team like for me like that's that's pleasure like it's pleasurable it's absolutely brilliant um Anyway, last question. Sorry, we're running slightly over time, but I'm sure everybody uh, appreciates hearing more from you, Shay. Um, this is from Mina. I work in the VORG, Violence Against Women and Girls um, space, um, and the sister space, space stuff online has made me really angry with how, they, um, how Ngozi Fulani was treated and the levels of racism. I got so upset as we saw women who work in VORG also racially gaslight uh, sister space. And the whole situation has made me think about who is a friend or a support to us in the sector. I felt really disappointed. How do you deal with the disappointment from all of this online shit? And this has been what's been happening. And it's been so like timely, this event, because literally like all of the Davo shit that's been going on with Ngozi has been like, it's been, it's been really, really hard to hear, but actually everything you need to know is in this book. Like, sorry, like to bring up the book again, but like, I was reading this, rereading it today, and it was literally like all of the things that I'm seeing people do to support Ngozi is like textbook <laughs> from here. Um, I'm like, has everybody been reading Shay's book? Um, but Shay, what, what's your, what's your uh, answer? How do you deal with the disappointment from it all? Um, so first thing to say, the whole sister space um, uh, kind of fallout and what happened to Ngozi is awful. And I think it's because of writing the book and being so attuned to like my body and my boundaries is why I said no to going to that event twice. I did ask somebody else in the team, would you like to go? But here are the things that you should be, you should be con uh, concerned with. Do you have the capacity to engage with a white dominant institution? Do you have a capacity to be tokenized? Like asking yourself those questions, do you have the capacity for this? is really important when engaging in those spaces. And I think that has been a lesson for all of us. And I think Negosi has handled this whole situation better than me, because if it was me, the way I'm tired, the way I've been homeless the last six weeks, I would have disgraced myself and my name. So Negosi, <laughs> I just want to put it out there that I think Negosi has done an amazing job, but the disappointment has been hard. And if I wasn't sick this week, it was already in my draft emails to send an email to Sister Space in solidarity. So I think that's something that we can all do to send them love because they're receiving a lot of hate. So if you can send them love, send them flowers, send them a card, send them treat well gift cards, send them something that shows that they've been seen. That it are That is ray of light in what feels like meteor showers of just waves of waves and waves of um, this um, being spread because people are also jumping on this for their five minutes of fame. They know it's a trending topic to talk about, talk, talk about. So then that's why you've got Piers Morgan and all of these malarkey people um, talking about it. So it's always gonna be waves and ripples across different platforms. So just keep sending them love and um, and keep them in your thoughts and, and your prayers. In, this, in handling the disappointment, I think you can decide whether you have the capacity or someone in your team had the capacity to do the calling or the call out. Like you can say to them, you can write to them, you can send a DM and say, look, in this space, 
or in with, with the values you portray or with the work that you do in the role that you have, these are the things that I would ask you to reflect on for X, Y, Z reasons. Give them that moment of reflection because some people don't know how to be allies in this space. Some people still don't know because we don't have this on the curriculum, right? How to be a good digital citizen. So in that, in that one that one time I do give benefit of the doubt like okay maybe you don't know if there are some people that evidently should know better and are being um I don't jump in the bandwagon I honestly think we should block them I don't think we should give them limelight I think we should start we, we can either be doing whistleblowing stuff with charity so why or any other kind of uh, whistleblowing um mo movements and organizations there but we just stop giving these organizations and these and these people credit let's just stop amplifying them because if this is how they treat a black woman i promise you in 2023 you're going to see how they're going to come for all of us all of us because it always starts with a black woman first so let's just stop giving them so much power and so much status because i've had a rockers yeah with one of the most powerful powerful vogue charities in the uk one of the most powerful ones and i stood my ground and i won and i don't give them any more any more limelight i don't give them any more um uh attention and it is very obvious and that says enough well we stop we starve them of the attention that they need because they can't stay relevant they need to jump on the bandwagon of causing more harm to negotiate. You are desperately showing that you're not relevant. You're not doing your work. You're not living to your charitable objectives. And let me stop here before I get myself into trouble. <laughs> I think that's perfect. I think for me, like we were having a conversation at the last event, which was um, about uh, representation politics, about like, why would, who do we expect to, to do certain things? Like for me, like, I don't know you from Adam, like, why am I going to be disappointed in you moving wayward, to be honest? Like, for me, I'll be disappointed in my in my community. So I can see you, um, that kind of disappointment coming from, like, other people working in Vogue. But for me, Mina, it's like, who, who are you in community with? Like, who are your allies, your close friends, the people that you want to be in the trenches with, as Shay said earlier? Those are the people that you can be disappointed with, yeah? <laughs> when they, if they let you down. But, like, for me, I'm like... I've, I've moved on from expecting people that I don't know or who are out there looking for clout to do anything other than disappoint me, you know? And actually like, I feel like, yeah, like for me, like I'm only really interested in the people that I'm in community with now. Those are the people that I'm going to be in this fight with. Those are the people that I want to hold accountable. Those are the people that I want to hold me accountable. And like, since I've done that, I don't give a crap what people say online. <laughs> I really don't care because it's 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 irrelevant, right? But at the same time, like I have a duty to be a good digital digital citizen, and I think I need to decide what that means for me. Um, and I think we all need to decide what that means for us. And obviously, there is this amazing book that gives you a lot of ideas. <laughs> but I will leave it there and just say thank you so much, Shay. Like, obviously, it's always a pleasure. This is the first time it's actually been the Shay and Martha show. Normally, it's the Shay and Martha and Cam show. We ditched one person, <laughs> and now it's just me and you, baby. Uh, <laughs> but thank you so much for joining us today. I've had such a good time. Just so everybody knows, this is the last event of the year. Like, I'm closing off for the year. Um, this has been a really, 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 like, joyful and fun and inspiring way to end our BAME Online series for 2022. Final words. Look, we are about to approach a time where a lot of people will use social media platforms just remember to be intentional. Just remember to be really intentional and look after yourself in this moment. And when we are trauma informed, not trauma led, we let we will not be behaving in a place of reactivity and causing potential, potentially causing more harm. Um, and yeah, uh, thank you so much, Martha, for this brilliant conversation. Uh, it's given me a, like a nice boost of joy and hope again of like this work because it has been a bit of a tough couple of weeks with the whole Elon Musk saga. So thanks very much. And yeah, please support Glitch. We've got an amazing, exciting research project coming up next spring, focusing on black women. Yes, we won't we do it. And it's really exciting with text gain and looking at how misogynoir um, appears online. And so we would really love your support. Check out Glitch's uh, website, glitchcharity.co.uk and join our mailing list if you want to know more. Get this book. Get this book, Shay. Sell your book. Like, what? <laughs> it gives me the ick. But yes, please do get this book. I feel like you should just roll me out because I would literally just be like, da 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 da. <laughs> Thank you so much. Take care, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Thanks so much,
You did well. You did really well. Bye, everyone. See you in the new year.